with me to the book of Malachi, chapter 1. Before we read anything from the book of Malachi, I would like to furnish the background of uh, the, 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 the story there. Are we going to have that on, on the screen? Malachi, okay. How many of you all have ever read the book of Malachi? Show me. Oh, that's lovely. How many of you all have heard a sermon from the book of Malachi? That's lovely. How many of you all have heard a message from the first chapter of Malachi? Uh oh, uh oh. Maybe you heard from chapter 3 about tithes and offerings, right? Wow, we are all uh, money interested people. You know, but that's lovely because money is not the root of evil. It's the love of money which is the root of all evil. Now, today I'm going to, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a huge message. I have a very big exegesis of the entire book of Malachi, but I'm going to concentrate only on chapter 1 and a few verses there, because the whole uh, four chapters are very comprehensive and they have a great detail of the history of his, Israel and uh, the second coming of Jesus. So it covers a huge era. But let's concentrate on the first chapter alone, okay? Now let's go back to the history. After the reign of Saul, David and Solomon, the nation of Israel was divided into two, namely the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. Northern kingdom comprising of ten tribes and the southern kingdom two tribes. And the Davidic line of the kings were, was maintained in the southern kingdom, the name of which was Judah. There were twenty kings after Solomon, who ruled the nation of Judah, 14 of whom were evil ones, but 6 were good kings. Now God gave prophecy after prophecy to them saying, If you don't pull yourselves together in me, if you don't come back to the word of God, you, if you continue to live in sin, I'm going to sell you to the Babylonians. Right? So, the Babylonians invaded the nation of Judah three times, once in 609 BC. They, when, when he took uh, Daniel, Shatrach, Meshach and Abednego to Babylon. And then in 597 BC, when people like Ezekiel were taken to Babylon. But then finally Nebuchadnezzar invaded Judah and destroyed the entire country, including the temple in 586 BC. But God wanted to keep the Davidic line in existence, unlike the northern kingdom, which was Israel. Israel, having had 19 kings after Solomon, was completely destroyed by the Assyrians in 722 BC, and they were all scattered all over the world, and they began to come back to their nation only after the 14th of May, 1948. Amen. Okay? After the Second World War. So let's not concentrate on the Northern Kingdom. Now already some people are put off because they, they now think, my goodness, we thought we will hear a message. This guy is talking history. Right? Now I'll give a brief idea of the historical background of Malachi and then we will come to the Word of God. Okay? After living in Babylon for 70 years, they started to come back. By the time they began to come, the, uh, the nation of Babylon was not ruling the world because they fell to the hands of the Persians. So it was when the Persians were ruling the world that the, the people of Judah began to come back to their land. In three groups did they come. The first group came with somebody called Zerubbabel and there was a high priest called Yeshua. And then the second group came under the leadership of Ezra. And then the third group under the leadership of Nehemiah. Now, when Zerubbabel brought the first group, they began to build the temple, which was destroyed over 70 years ago by the Babylonians. Now when they were building, the people who returned from Babylon were so haphazard in that work, because they, they wanted to build their homes and stuff. 
and and they also had a lot of um, opposition from many people. They needed some prophetic backing, and that is why God sent prophets like Haggai and Zechariah. If you read Haggai and Zechariah, you will see a lot of prophecies pertaining to the second temple that they were building. But after Haggai and Zechariah, there was a prophetic absence for about a century. No prophets came to speak any God's word to them. Now this is where you need to really uh, understand the background of the book of Malachi. Now the people had returned after being away for at least 70 years. So if at all somebody remembered anything of that land, they would be people who are over the age of 75. Because a 75 year old person would then say, I, I, I was 5 when I was taken away from this land. So they did not know what, how Judah looked like. They did not know how to rebuild the nation because it was uninhabited. And there were huge trees where once houses stood. So for them to have come back from Babylon and to rebuild the nation, it was horrendous. And they had been disturbed culturally, religiously, economically, and in every way. Why? Because they were not living in their own country. Now I am a Sri Lankan. I, I meet Sri Lankan people who migrated uh, to United Kingdom when our problems began in Sri Lanka and you know 10 or 20 years after they uh, migrated their children don't even speak our Sri Lankan language they know only English now that's a, a, a mere 20 years now you imagine if somebody come say Sri Lankans come and invade Isle of Skye Wow, it would be wonderful, right? <laughs> and then we take you to Sri Lanka. And 70 years later, you slowly come back to Isle of Sky and try to search for the places where your forefathers lived, try to trace the land, and I'll tell you, that, that's not easy. Now, these people took many, many decades to pull themselves together. Many, many decades to try to build their lives together. They had problems. They don't know where they have to build, build their homes. How to build their homes? Who was funding them? You know, America was not there, right? <laughs> United Nations was not there. But there were enemies of these people. So these people were so downhearted. They were so upset. On the one hand, they believed in, in one God and they believed in the Torah, the word of God. But nobody was there to come and encourage them in the word of the Lord because there was no prophet. So they were dry people. They were like a church without a past. They were like people without a shepherd, sheep without a shepherd. And, and yet they had to continue to do godly things. Or else, what happened to their forefathers might happen to them again. They know their stories very well, don't they? They know how that their people were warned and warned and warned. And then because they were hard necks, they were sold into Babylon. Now they have come and come back and they did not have a king now. They were under the Persian governors and they don't want to upset God and thereby forfeit the, the privilege of at least being in, in, in their own land and become exiles in another land. Are you with me? So they had to please God. How did they please God? They gave offerings to God. They went to temple on Sabbath and, and, and they practiced the law. But then they had other practical problems to, to <coughs> live. Now it was in that sort of climate that one day they hear a message that a messenger of God has come to preach. Malachi means my messenger. Malachi, the messenger of God. So the word goes to the entire nation of Judah. 
A prophet has come with the message of God. Now these people are so happy that at last after about a century, we have somebody to say something from God. Apart from the first five books that they were reading. Now, now look. Now look at you and I. We have a wonderful Bible, don't we? Yes. Now you people have Bibles. You English speaking people have the King James Version, the New King James Version, the New International Version, the New American Standard Bible. Maybe you have an Isle of Sky Version. Who knows? <laughs> right? You have more versions in the Bible than the, than the number of verses in the Bible. <laughs> And yet, it's a difference to hear the word of God from somebody by way of a prophecy, right? It's God's word that you have. And when you read the Bible, obviously the Holy Spirit <coughs> speaks to you. Yeah. But it's a difference when somebody says something to you. Because it's personal, it's exegetical because they have taken from the Bible. And it's emotionally wonderful because it touches us. So these people who were reading the, the five books of the Bible or, or the Torah, which was their Bible, boy, now they have a prophet. So they all flocked to hear what Malachi had got to say. Now a li little bit about the book. This book was written 400 years before Jesus came. And this was the last book of the Old Testament. Now we say that, sir, period of silence between Malachi and Jesus. But far from silence, that was a busy 400 years. Right? Now, so many things happened. But then it was a prophet, there was a prophetic absence for 400 years until John the Baptist came. Okay? Are you with me? Do you understand my English? Yes. Right. Because I speak English, Queen's English, which the colonial people brought to Sri Lanka and you here in Scottish. <laughs> right? Okay. Now, <laughs> so now Malachi is going to preach. Now this, the form the book takes is rhetorical. Where Malachi says something to the people as from God. And then he also says something by way of the response of the people. And then what God responds to the response of the people. So every issue, there are so many issues. I'm going to deal with four issues today. There are so many issues, one of which you know very well, tithes and offerings. But I'm not going to talk about tithes and offerings today. So these issues, so Malachi would say something. And then he would also say, but you say something in return to what I say. And God says, so, so that's how the form of the book of Malachi takes. Now, let us read verse 2. This is the first message Malachi is delivering to these people. I have loved you, says the Lord. <laughs> you know, it, it, it may sound lovely. It may sound lovely to hear God loves you. But this is the message everyone preaches, everyone says, and the Bible says, and everybody knows it only too well. That is not something that you want to hear from a visiting speaker. You know, I mean, if you have a visiting speaker, and if you want to re really hear some stuff, you want to know or hear something that you don't hear all the time. <laughs> and you hear that God loves you. If, if we ask, come on, give us a memory verse, you know, many people in the Old Testament, they know Psalms 23. The Lord is my shepherd and I shall not want. In the New Testament, they will say, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, so that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now the verse that my brother Gary read here, Romans chapter 5, how many people know by heart? Not many. But John 3.16, come on, tell me. How many of you all know? John 3.16. Now if you don't know John 3.16, please backslide. <laughs> because it's futile for us to not even know the main verse in the New Testament. Right? Now am I talking to some happy people here? <laughs> Why do you sound very 
I love sky ish. <laughs> come on, come on, be happy. Yeah. Huh? Only when we are happy that we can really receive the word of God. So when people, you know, when we when people came to hear a message from the prophet, after about hundred years, they didn't want to hear, I have loved you, says the Lord. It's so simple. Any any child they can speak that. That's what we, we teach the children. God loves the little children. Right? And every child is taught that. Now we want something serious which pertains to our problem. Now what's the problem we have? We claim, that you, now I'm speaking on behalf of the Jews there. We claim to know the only true and living God. We are the only monotheistic people in that era. And all the others we say are worshipping idols and things that are not gods. But all of them are doing well. They have their own countries with their own kings and they have their own hospitals and schools. Whereas we who claim to have the only true living God are miserable. <clears throat> now, now look at Christianity in the world today. It's our people who get killed in Africa, in Afghanistan, in India, in Sri Lanka, in South America. You know, if, if, if there is any religious missionary who gets killed, it's a Christian missionary. Do you hear that a Muslim missionary was killed in India? That a Hindu missionary was killed in UK? Right? No. We are the bites, you know. People just kill us. Now when we need to build a church, we need to raise funds and obtain permission and all, all the whatnots. But all the other religious faiths, in their countries or outside, they have all the money to do what they want in their religion. Right? So, always it is the Christians who have to go through all the trouble. When all the others flourish and, and they, they, they grow. So that was the same with the people of Judah. And when they were so upset, yet claiming to have the best, uh, the, the, the true and living God, they had a question. I mean, we know that our God exists. We know that we worship the true and living God. But why are we suffering over against all the others who are not? So maybe God doesn't really love us. There is something wrong in the way God loves us. So they respond by saying, but you ask, how have you loved us? See, when Malachi goes and says to them, God says he loves you. These people say, ask God, how has he loved us? Many of our Christians have the same problem here. Some people would say, if God loves me, why am I ill for the past 12 years? I know the word Yahweh Rofi, Jehovah Rapha, the Lord who heals. But my God has not healed me. I have gone to healing meetings. I have asked people to pray. I have fasted and prayed. And just as the book of James says, and the book of Hebrews, I have got the elders of the church come and anoint oil and pray for me. I have done everything for the past 12 years. I'm still ill. And I am still suffering financially. I'm paying my tithes. I'm giving offerings. I'm, 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 I'm okay. I'm even sending missionary funds. But I'm struggling. I'm struggling. God is not blessing me financially. Now look at my family. I have family problems. I have problems in my home. I have, I don't own a home. I'm struggling to pay my mortgage. I don't have a good home. I don't have a good family. Look, the family is going through turbulences. My son is doing that and my daughter is doing this and my husband is doing that. My wife is doing that. Look, there is no peace in the family. There is nothing in the family. So how, why doesn't God do something about that? After all, I'm praying and I'm hearing messages that God loves me. 
If you love me, Lord, why have I got to go through what I am going through? And then, to that, God responds in a very funny way. He talks history. He says, was not Esau Jacob's brother? There goes God again. You know, you come to hear God, something about your situation, but he talks about history. Now who cares? I mean, look, it's just like telling you, right, asking you about your parents. Wouldn't you know, how many of you all don't know who John Knox is? If you say, if you don't know John Knox, I'm going to kidnap you and take you to Sri Lanka. <laughs> John Knox is considered as the spiritual father of Scotland. Am I right? Yeah. yeah. Now, it's just like telling a Scots person, do you know John Knox? It is just like that. God is saying, was not Esau Jacob's brother? Well, you know, they know that only too well. Abraham, Abraham had a son. He was Isaac. And Isaac had two sons. One was Esau and Jacob. And Esau lost his birthright. And Jacob became Israel. And Jacob was their forefather. And they knew their story very well. And why would God want to talk about history? But look at this. What he says next is interesting. Yet I have loved Jacob, but Esau I have hated. Now God was retrospectively talking about his love already shown to them in history. He says, I chose Yaakov, Jacob, the supplanter, the deceiver. And I loved him over against Esau, who I hate. Now you stem from Jacob. You come from Jacob. You are the descendants of the deceiver. You are the descendants of the supplanter. You are no good. You are evil. I should have killed you. And yet, because I loved your forefather, you exist. And your love have I demonstrated in Jacob. Now what? Now that was about 1800 uh, of history, years of history. He was referring to something that happened 1816 or 18 centuries uh, earlier. And today my dear friends, if you have, not if, I definitely know that in many of your hearts, you have this question. Does the Lord truly love me? He seems to be speaking to that person, this person and that person, not to me. He seems to be blessing those people, not me. Does he truly love me? Now if that is what you are thinking, God is saying, just look at 2,000 years ago, the cross of Calvary, where I already showed you my love. Yes. You know, the Lord's love for us is not to be shown or proven by his miracles that he's, going, he's doing in our lives. He doesn't need to heal us to prove that he loves us. He doesn't need to sort our family problems to prove that he loves us. He doesn't need to bless us financially or give us our own home or our own car to prove that he loves us. God can give you a brand new car. But 10 years from now that car is a 10 year old car. But he gave something called salvation to us even before we were born. Amen. And that salvation is brand new. Hallelujah. When we die and go, we are going with salvation. Not with our house, not with our car, Amen. not with our solved family, the problem solved family. We are going with salvation. Amen. And God says, therefore I have shown you the best love. No other God, no other man. Can show you. What's that? I have given you salvation. Yes. So he tells you. Now you show me. Something better than salvation. And then I'll give you that. And I'll prove you that I love you. There's nothing. Better than salvation. There's no religion. That can give you salvation. 
Only Jesus can give salvation. You know, religions can give anything but salvation. God gives us salvation. What more does he need to give? But I'm not saying God is not going to heal you or bless you or, you know, solve your problems. No, he's more than able to do that because he's omnipotent. He's all powerful. But if for some reasons best known to him, if he decides to let us continue the way we are, fine. Because he has given us salvation. That's the first message that Malachi gave them. And I believe the Lord is giving you. Why? Because we are in the last days. We are in the last days. Just as the Jews were in Malachi's days. That was the last Old Testament prophecy that they received. After 400 years of silence, Jesus came. And our Jesus is coming back soon. Who knows if he's going to come tonight. Before I return to Sri Lanka. So, this is a very, very important message. Let's go to verse 6. Verse 6. This is number 2. He says, A son honors his father, and a servant his master. If I am a father, where is the honor due me? If I am a master, where is the respect due me? Says the Lord Almighty, It is you, O priests. Who show contempt for my name. Now this is an exclusive message to the priests. Now in the New Testament, who are the priests? All of us. You know that song? We are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people who would show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness, out of darkness. Out of darkness into his marvelous light. Amen. Peter wrote that. We are all royal priests. For us, God says this. Now when Malachi spoke to them, he said, A son honors his father. Now that's true in that culture. Now don't bring that to today's culture, where the cultural values are deteriorating and Many children don't have any respect to their fathers or parents, right? Whereas in the Jewish culture, especially in the days of Malachi, a son trembled in the presence of the father. That was the, 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 the awe, the, the honor that a father received in those days. But I know even today, the people respect their master, the boss, in their workplaces. Why? Right? Because if you lose the job, then you lose bucks. Right? So you better keep your boss in good books and you be in good books with your boss. So many people, you know, they, they try to please their master. Now, how do you please your master or how do you please your father well, if you respect your father? The best thing is to behave when they are around. <laughs> you behave when they are around. Now, these people failed to realize something, the Jews. They failed to realize that their master and their father, God, was omnipresent. Just like us, the Christians. You know, God, you are all over. Now, that is just a phraseology that we use. We don't believe it. We don't believe that God is omnipresent and he is there with us no matter what. So he says, you Christians, you call me, Abba, Father, let me be. You know, you call me Lord. You call me Master. Yahweh, Adonai, means Master. But you don't honor me that way. So the people didn't understand. Now even you might not understand. I'll tell you something. Christianity is not a religion of do's and don'ts. Okay? Now the problem is, in the past, Without realizing this, Christianity has preached messages of do's and don'ts. Don't smoke cigarettes, they would say. But where in the Bible do you see that thou shalt not smoke cigarettes? Right? Of course you get some thou shalt not. Right? You, know, you say, you hear thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt... But then you know those days it said thou shalt not eat pig. You know, we are eating pork, right? So, there is a confusion. Can we drink alcohol? How much can we drink alcohol? Can we smoke? Can we do this? 
Can we do that? I'll tell you, Christians are the best people to confuse others. <laughs> Why do we confuse? Because we are confused. Now if we discuss and sit and discuss, everything becomes relative. Now you, you virtually can't do anything in this country. So, what does God say? God says, you call me father, you call me boss, but the way you behave doesn't seem that you respect me. He said, where is the respect due me? Where is the honor due me? So, I'll tell you, it's easy for us to, uh, it's, it's easy for us to live as Christians. We can do anything. Paul says that, I can do all things. We can do anything. If you want to smoke, you can smoke. If you want to kill, go ahead and kill. If you want to commit adultery, fine. Right? You can do anything. But make sure that some of the things that upset God are there. And when you do those things, find a place where God is not around. <laughs> I have a very humorous way of saying this. Maybe David, you know, David had a weakness for women, you know that, don't you? Maybe he got hold of some prostitutes and he got a big bottle of whatever, you know, scotch whiskey. <laughs> and a good packet of cigarettes. And, and, and he, he wanted a place where God is not there, you know. So he maybe hired a nuclear submarine and he went seven miles deep into the Pacific Ocean. The deepest point is seven miles. And then he opened the bottle. God was there. Then he came back and he went to America, hired a rocket from NASA, went up to some of the planets and he parked his rocket in a star. And you know, he sat there with those prostitutes who he had and then he opened the bottle and boy, he, there was God. So he was so frustrated, he came down and wrote Psalm 139. <laughs> Do you know what Psalm 139 says? Lord, even if I go to the depths of the ocean, you are there. Even if I pitch my tent among the stars, you, your spirit is there. Where can I go away from you? Lovely, isn't it? So if you want to do something that your father, your master could be offended, find a way. Now you have many arid places in the Isle of Skye. Right? <laughs> Not like downtown Glasgow or London. Right? Try going there and do your, commit your sin and see whether God is not there. We are not a religion of do's and don'ts. Do anything. But make sure that God is there. So what you would not do in the presence of your honorable father and your honorable master, you will not do when God is there. So you may be all alone in your room with the possibility of committing the sin, but make sure that God is there and he is your father and he is your master. That's what God is saying. Now Christians cannot have secret sins because we don't have secrets. We can hide from other people. But God is there, watching us 24 hours a day. So we don't have secrets. So how can we have secret sins? So let's honor God as our Father and our Master. Let's go to verse 8, please. Thirdly, when you bring blind animals for sacrifice, God asks, is that not wrong? When you sacrifice crippled or deceased animals, is that not wrong? Now let's pause there for a moment. What was happening in uh, Malachi's days? You know, because of the financial condition of these people, they had cattle and they had animals, you know, they, 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 they herd sheep and they were doing, doing all those things. But, you know, as I told you earlier, they wanted to be in good books with the Lord, you know, they wanted to please God, lest they are sold as captives to some other nation. So they wanted to, to bring sacrifices to God. And what did they do? They went to their store and they saw, you know, these some of their animals that were going to die two days from now. 
animals that are blind, animals that are crippled. They thought, boy, I'll take these and give to, to the temple so they can get rid of these sick animals and also they can please God. Just like many Christians today. You know, we have to pray, we have to read the word and we have to go to church and everything. But do you know many people pray when they get time? Many people read the word after reading their magazines and you know, the stuff that they like to read. I know many people in, in, in the western countries read their mail before the Bible. Right? And then what happens? They go to church if they feel okay. If they are not tired, if they don't have any work. Now, I can speak boldly because this is my first ever visit to this church. And I have no problem because I don't know how you behave and I think you are a perfect church. I believe you all of you come to church on time. I believe all of you come to church every Sunday. And I believe everybody read the word and pray the first thing that you do in your day. I, I can see that in your faces. My goodness. Look at the holy faces that I see. But you know there are others from all the other churches in the world. Who don't pray and don't read the word and don't go to church the way they ought to. Why? Because they are so busy. They are so caught up in many things. They have other things to do. God can wait. He is eternal after all. right? He can wait. The church can wait. Nobody is going to shoot you if you come late. Right? Will you do that? No. Now, God is so upset about that. God says, is that okay when you give me the second best? What about the talents? What about the abilities? You know, many musicians, you know, they want to play music for a larger audience. Now in church, you just get a handful of people. And very dumb people too. You know, you can, you can, be, you can perform well. Nobody comes and says, you performed well. Not in this church, you know, every other church. <laughs> right? So, so what happens is, what happens is, Many people give God the second best. Now God is a humorous God and when he gets upset, he does things very nicely. Look at what he says. Try offering them to your governor. Would he be pleased with you? Would he accept you? Says the Lord Almighty. Now they were under a Persian governor. That's what he meant. But then I'll contextualize it. Now who is the governor if you are studying in a school? The school authorities. Who is the governor of your, of your workplace? Your boss. Who is the governor in the train that you go? The conductor. And in the, in the, in the, in the bus, the driver. So you get governors all over. You know, you go to the court. The governors are the tellers, you know, who are sitting up. They won't allow you to take stuff outside the court without paying for it. So they are the governors, right? They are the ones who maintain the place. So, you, I know you, you all never come late to church, but you know, if you look at other churches where people come late, can they go late to their workplace? Those who send their Sunday school, their children to Sunday school late, will they send their children late to school? No. You should look at them on Mondays. How rushy they are to send their school children to schools. Right? And how hurry and you know how they jump from here to there. You know, they they just jump from their bedroom to the bathroom and then from there to the bedroom and then in a jiffy they are downstairs ready to go for work. And they when they hit the road. They don't remember whether they had a cup of tea or a coffee or they ate. Why? Because they must go for work on time. But the same person comes to church, you know, half an hour late. And as soon as he or she comes, you know, they don't feel any sense of guilt. They just blend in with the worship and they are very happy. No guilty feeling. And one Sunday when they get up, 
They don't feel like going to church because they're tired. Hey, don't feel like going for work on Wednesday. <laughs> That's what God is saying. Yeah. And when the offering plate goes around, you should... Now, I didn't look at how you all gave offerings, but I have experience because I'm going all over the world. So they open the wallet and they take money out and they think 20 pounds. God has enough money. Why 20 pounds? 10 pounds. I have some bills to pay. Why 10 pounds? So I close that compartment fully. And I have another compartment where I have coins. I have one pound coins with the queen's head in it. Now, well, you know what? Why waste the one pound when I have a 50 pound? But wait a minute. It's too big. Wow! Glory to God! I have a one penny and a five penny. So I give the five penny and God gets the one penny free. <laughs> you know, this is an exaggeration, but I'll tell you, this is the attitude of many people when it comes to giving God. Uh, you know, I mean, uh, this, it is not within this message to talk about tithes, but tithes is one tenth of all the money that you get, right? God accidentally gives you 100 pounds, whereas he should have given you only 90 pounds. So the best thing is to return that 10 pounds, right? If I come to your house, and if I forgot my mobile phone in your house, you are going to, you're not going to say, glory to God, praise God, God has given me a mobile phone. You are not going to say, oh, my son needed a mobile phone. Look at how God blessed me with a mobile phone. If you do that, you are a thief, you are a rogue, you are a culprit. Because it doesn't belong to you. Just because I came and accidentally forgot that. What you will do is you will try to return this to me ASAP. If you can't find me, you will at least give it to your pastor and make it sure that this comes to me. Why? Because the more you keep it in your house, the more you are a thief. So if you cling on to your tithes, you are a thief. You have to pay. Now you won't give me back the mobile phone, the upper section one week, and then the keyboard section, and then the SIM card differently, and the battery finally. You don't return to me something on installments. You just give the machine to me just like that, intact. So when you pay your tithes, you don't pay on installments. Right? You pay the whole time on time to your church and that's it. Forget about it. Okay? Why? Because it belongs to God. But when it comes to giving God tithes or offerings or anything, you know, people are so sad and upset. Right? They don't give God the best. They give God the second best. The, the, the leftovers. Okay, Lord, now I have read my newspaper, I have done my Facebook, now I have uh, spoken to all the people, now I have a little bit of time. <sighs> Speak to me, Lord. And they open the Bible. That was what these people were doing. So God says, try doing that to the governor. You go, now, 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 now when we talk about tithes, some people would say, huh, Suresh, you can talk about tithes, but do you know the petrol prices have gone up? Do you know that the council taxes have gone up? Do you know that the inflation, you know, there is a credit crunch and you know what not? You don't understand. But God understands. Now try doing that in the railway station. The next time you go to, to, to Inverness from Kyle of Lakosh, when the train conductor comes and when he wants 10 pounds from you, you tell him, come on, you don't know the kind of problems I have. <laughs> You don't know how much electricity price I have to pay. Now I can, out of a very magnanimous heart, give you two pounds. Just take it. He'll kick you out at the next station, right? You can't get into a bus and you can't go and buy stuff at the core. And when it says 40 pounds, you can't tell that girl, hey, you also know the kind of life we are li living here. I won't give you 40 pounds, I'll give you 10 pounds. No, you don't do that. You can't go late for work and then when they ask you why are you late, you can't give the reasons. You can't say, I had too many clothes.
clothes to wash. I had visitors over the weekend, so I had to do, arrange the house. How dare you ask me why I came in? I at least came half a whole day. Be happy because of that. Try doing that. Many people think, at least I came to church. How many people don't go to church? I came to church late and Suresh is upset about that. No, Suresh is not upset. God is. God is saying, try doing that to the government. Would, would he be pleased? So God was trying to explain it. Finally, verse 10. Oh, that one of you would shut the temple doors so that you would not light useless fires on my altar. I'm not pleased with you, says the Lord Almighty, and I will accept no offering from your hands. Let me explain this. You know, the temple had two huge doors. Huge doors. And eight people had to open and close each side. Sixteen people were used to open and close the door. And the altar was huge. There were five different uh, offerings in the Old Testament. Only one of them was a cereal offering. The rest were the, the sin offering, the trespass offering, the burnt offering, and the peace offering. So all these offerings involved animal sacrifices. So the altars were big. And people had to light fire, not the priests. Some others had to light the fire in the altar. So when people brought animals, the, the, the meat thereof was taken home by the priest, right? Unless it was a burnt offering when everything was burnt. They, the priests had to, they had the biblical rights to take the, 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 the meat to their homes. And these people who worked in the temple, you know, who opened the, and closed the door, you know, those who lit the fire, you know, they... They were talking to each other. They said, well, you know, these priests, my goodness, these fellows take all the meat. Why don't they give us a small piece too? Now we are toiling here. They are doing the easy work. We are doing the hard work. So why don't we get a little something? Now that is why God is upset. God says, who among you will serve me free? Many Christians are like that. You know, these people would serve the Lord and then they would think, my goodness, I have been serving this church for the past eight years. Nobody gave me anything. Now what is the, the, the wages he is talking about? It's not just money or material things. What about, thank you, well done, oh that was good, you know. Many people perform in the church or do things in the church and when they don't receive thanks, they are upset. When they are not appreciated, they are sad. And they grumble and mumble over this attitude. Some people would say, I have driven the car to haul people to the church for the past so many number of years. I never asked petrol money from the church. It was, I pocketed, pocketed it, out, it out. But you know, nobody says thanks. They think, you know, I am a slave. I have done that for seven years. They think that it's my obligation to do that. I have arranged the chairs. I have played music. No offense to you. You know, I just saw you doing a good job here. I don't know how long you are doing this, but I'm just saying. Oh, I have played music. I have preached. I have served. I have done that. I have taught in Sunday school. But nobody appreciates me. You know, there are two kinds of wages. The salary and the tip. Right? You know, when we go to a restaurant, we pay the bill, and then we leave a little tip uh, to people. Do you tip in, in, in Scotland? Do you? Wow. Do you know the difference between a Canadian and a canoe? The canoe, canoe, you know a canoe, right? The canoe tips. <laughs> anyway, praise God, I'm not in Canada. <laughs> now, you see, you know, we have been received a salary. And that is the salvation. Again, the salvation is not just a gift. 
But it's a salary. It's a payment. I don't need to work free for the Lord. God gave me salvation even before I was born. Of course, I had to repent and accept Jesus as my Savior to acquire it. The salvation was already available for me to get. So now I have acquired it. That was paid for me long before I was born. Very long before I was born. 2000 years before I was born. And this is the only place, the kingdom of God is the only company which pays you before you are born for your services. So every one of you who is saved is obliged to serve the Lord. If you are saved, serve the Lord. Nobody needs to say thank you. Nobody needs to say please. Can you please, if you are a keyboardist, you have to play the keyboard. Now that doesn't mean that if all of you are keyboardists, all of you must be up here, nobody down there. You know, there should be order and everything in the church. But you know, nobody needs to come and beg from you. Can you please play the keyboard for the service? Can you please come for service? Can you please attend the Bible study? Can you please teach in the Sunday school? Nobody needs to beg you because if you can do something for the Lord, you must do because you are paid for that. Amen. And if you don't do, you are a rogue. You have received the salary and you are not working. And if you have received the salary and if the salary is good, don't expect tips. Do you know who expects tips? You know the ones who are paid the minimum. You know if they get small money, then they would really wonder, they would really expect the people to leave a big tip, you know. And I, I, you know the thank yous and the well done's and the offerings and stuff that I receive when I go to preach. These are all tips. I don't mind receiving tips. When people say, thank you Suresh, okay, I'll take that tip. Well done Suresh, okay. Come back again. Okay. Don't come back again. <laughs> right? Some people give me offerings. So I take that too. But wait a minute. What if I don't get a word of thanks? Imagine if nobody says thank you, or nobody says well done, or nobody says anything. Still, I got to do what I am supposed to do because I am on a very high salary package. I am not after tips. Amen. That's exactly what God is expecting from every one of us. Yes. Let me wrap this up. My dear brothers and sisters, I believe the Lord spoke to you. Yes. At least in one of those four points. Yes.